Hello and welcome to Star Citizen Sunday. This is a weekly show which covers all the news from Star Citizen from the week just past. I am your host, Mac, so let's get on with it. This week, we see how the Banu Defender is coming along. Todd Pappy answers our questions regarding the upcoming patch 3.6, and it looks like the removal of the $0 CCUs has taken more than people bargained for. So, on this week's Inside Star Citizen, they first spoke to Dave Colson about the flight model, and he wanted people to know that they are imperfect and learning from the community. They didn't understand combat as much as they do now, so they have brought it closer to what we want, but they know it's still not there yet. Future releases will benefit from them interacting with the community and ensuring that they gather more information. They also want to focus their vision and communicate this vision with the community so that they can make the quality of the feedback better as well. Kind of getting everyone on the same page. After this, we saw a couple of sprints Basically, sprints are what they, they sort of get a theory, run with it a bit, experiment with it, test it, and then review it to see if it's worth doing or not. First one was to look at Microtech clothing concepts, and this is from a manufacturer called ELD. They really just want to inject a bit of colour into the residents' lives. They're also experimenting for the potential of animated or glowing textures and how this could apply to clothing, which I think would be really, really cool. I am liking the bright colours. They're very more flamboyant. It looks very Japanese pop, but it should be a nice contrast to what we already have because it's a bit dull at the moment. For FPS weapons, they worked on the Animus missile launcher. This looks like a three-barreled repeater-style launcher. The animations look cool, and I'm sure this will help on the ground if we are being attacked by uh, maybe a ship. Environment Art looked into better ways to scale the natural features of planets and moons by exploring the current tech limits. They did say it's important to not always just explore new tech, but to push the limitations of the current tech. And if this is Daymar with its new canyons, I can't wait for them to implement them. They look so cool. It would be very exciting to go down planet side uh, and have to search through the canyons for maybe a derelict in some way. The Vanguard landing gear is seeing some changes, and I think this new tracked gear is looking awesome. So I'm glad that they went in that direction. Now we heard from the community feedback manager they have an entire reporting process dedicated to player feedback. This is what Brian Chambers was saying as we interviewed him on British and Con. They basically take what we don't find fun and compile the information, giving it to the developers so that they can take action on it. They look for topics which have come up repeatedly as a baseline. It's still subjective, so they support this with in-game analytics and feedback surveys from us. But these surveys allow them to take a deeper look into what players are saying and compare this to others. The analytics allow them to look at ships and items and weapons and get them more balanced. And this is done all the time, but it's obviously more active during PTUs and uh, patch releases. It just gives them a better idea of the game and make adjustments wherever needed, and that's good to know. Now, to finish off with on Inside Star Citizen, they looked at the Banu Defender. This is your primary fighter from the Banu. It's quick, it's nimble, it's agile, and deadly and it's mass produced as well apparently. It's going to be the first released Banu ship. The interior is completely new and has lots of organic flowing shapes. It will be so different to anything we have seen before. All the art is done from scratch. What they create for this ship will be the art tile set for future Banu ships. They're also able to make brand new alien materials. They have more freedom to create this different textures and whatnot. They're still exploring and dialing in based on feedback and it's still very much work in progress. They have got now a handful of artists working on it. There's a ton of work left, but they want to make sure it looks great and can be applied to other Banu ships. So hopefully it's still coming in 3.6. Anyway, that was Inside Star Citizen. So far, I'm liking these shows. Still a little short for my liking, but the information we get is definitely worth it. Let me know your thoughts. Let's move on to Star Citizen Live. So this week's Star Citizen Live was with Todd Pappy talking about 3.5, but more importantly 3.6. Now the first question was to do with VoIP or VOIP, voice over IP, what is happening with it? And he just says that they will be maintaining it and improving it as they go. He's not sure what they're specifically working on at the moment with VoIP, but it is continually being improved. Next question is to do with shareable missions in 3.6. Will there be any? A very important question, and unfortunately, no, not for 3.6. There's still some things they need to iron out before they can do this. He spoke a little bit about the new law system as well, and he says the plan is to have the law in the Stanton system and have areas with positive 
and negative zones. The positive zones will maybe add a few more lords and the negative zones will just take away a few. Right now they're figuring out the finer details of what will happen if you say, for example, bump a ship. Do you get fined? How much do you pay? Also things like flagging illicit goods. Will the AI recognize it? How will they react? Can they scan it? All this stuff needs to be sorted out, but hopefully a lot of that's coming with 3.6. Next question is to do with travel times. What's going to make them feel less boring? Now in a multi-crew ship, in long jumps, you can walk around, you can get up, you'll be able to uh, fix things, interact with things, check certain systems and so forth. For single-seater ships, Todd pitched the idea that you, if you're traveling in quantum travel and you haven't done something for, say, X amount of time, an anomaly will pop up and allow you to decide whether you want to investigate or not. Uh, it's entirely up to you. This could be anything like a combat mission, a non-combat mission, maybe just an investigation, a trap. Could be a multiple, multiple things. Uh, but also, he did say that jump points, so not quantum traveling, but jump points are more are going to be more like whitewater rafting and feel more active than travel times. But obviously, we do know there's going to be things like games to play on board. There's going to be TVs, radio stations, all these sort of other other areas. But that's a long way off at the moment. Now, we spoke about harvestable entity spawning and what it does. This tech is coming for 3.6 and basically allows trees and plants and other things to spawn items that you can pick and then place into your inventory, like an apple, for example. This will also apply to things like gems, so you can find gemstones. It kind of works with anything, he says, things like derelict ships, for example, but things like derelicts and so forth will come later on. This is just the first step that they're getting applied to plants and flora. I'm looking forward to these, especially in the areas of like survival or science, like experimenting with things and mining and trading, like, you know, finding gems and then selling them on. Those sort of stuff, really excited for that. Uh, someone asked about the shield effect. What's it look like, the new one? And he says it's sleek and form-fitting instead of this bubble effect. So the shields, he says, will mimic the surface of the ship, which does sound really, really cool. Someone asked if the mission payouts currently and the income that we, we earn, if it's accurate in any way. And they say, no, it all needs to be adjusted. They're looking at some tech to help give them better ideas on payouts. They want to get missions more localized as well, rather than requiring multiple jumps from place to place. But they also want to adjust how much items cost, for example. What they're going to try and do is get a system so that they can adjust the prices on the fly. Similar to what they can do now with ship performance. Doing it in engine makes it so much easier and quicker to change these factors. Someone asked about player hoods. And Todd says that there are different layers to player hoods. You've got... If you're not wearing a helmet, it's kind of like a contact lens hood. If you've got a helmet on, it's then your visor hood. In ships, you've got MFDs. As you transition from one to the other, it'll auto-adjust appropriately, giving you the right UI that you need. They are currently doing passes on this now, figuring out what info is relevant for each standpoint. So is it FPS? Are you in a ship cockpit, for example? They're also cleaning it all up. It is a very much very messy at the moment. Uh, but helmets are going to be role specific. So a combat helmet will show you your ammo count or your weapon information uh, versus maybe an exploration helmet, which will show you your atmospheric conditions. He says the difficult part is figuring out how helmet visors work within ship hoods. Uh, the UI obviously applies to all areas of Star Citizen, which is why it's a bit of a mess at the moment. They just need more resources to work on it. The next question is to do with spawn points. Uh, will we be able to choose our spawn point? And he says the plan is for you to eventually choose an initial spawn point and then you will travel around and rent or buy other areas. Obviously that's not available yet. It's currently set by where you land last uh, in terms of main landing locations. Someone asked what does it mean by player carryables and basically this is cleaning up and expanding the pickup code. So anytime you pick up or interact with an item making it cleaner and work better. It will in the future become more to do with your personal inventory but they want your inner thought intentions so these words you see over things when you hold F to have some form of say radial menu which allows you to do multiple actions quickly. Now the code for this is done but again they just need the UI for it and currently the UI are working on ship hoods. Uh, weapon attachments he says these are obviously things like sights, barrels, under barrels and magazines. From there it'll be grips um, and the affected parameters, how it changes the weapon in terms of uh, range, handling and so forth. This is all in progress. Uh, someone asked about ship rentals. They're currently working out the edge cases, like how long do you have it for? What happens if the timer runs out? Uh, if, what if there's cargo inside and the timer runs out? They also want to figure out whether it's a real world counter or an in-game counter. Uh, in terms of the multi-tool, 
the trying to get the attachments working, then ensuring the gameplay systems are there for it when it does work. But the team are currently working on weapon attachments, so that's not coming anytime soon. Someone uh, wanted information on misfires. Now, they're still working out at what point misfires happen. So maybe minor misfires come in at around 50% degradation of an item. Uh, maybe, maybe medium misfires come in at 75% and so forth. It all depends on the quality level of the item and ensuring that the player has the proper feedback to realize what is happening and why it's happening. They're still heavily discussing all this sort of stuff, but c the current thinking is you'll never be able to completely repair an item back to 100%. If your item has multiple misfires, maybe you can't repair it above 80% versus it just having a couple of misfires before you get it repaired, at which point it can get repaired to, say, 90%. So basically, if you run something into the ground, there will be less chance of a higher repair, which makes sense. Again, second-hand items are never as good as brand new items, uh, but I can't wait to see more on the repair mechanic. And someone asked about armistice zones. Now, they do want to remove armistice zones, so the inability to draw your weapon. They need the law system in place, and they also need some form of security in place, like turrets or what they do to you. Also, what happens if somebody just starts randomly shooting this all needs to be figured out before they can remove the armistice zones. Someone asked if ships stored in outposts can be relocated with cargo intact. And he says no, because this is a workaround. This is a shortcut. You could just log off in an outpost and respawn back at Port Olisar and have your ship transported. So that's not going to happen. Uh, auto landing. Someone asked if they could expand the distance in which it takes your ship automatically. And he says they've not spoke about this, but they could try it out and see how it feels. And finally, uh, what is the priority now based on our feedback like what is what are they working on and they say flight combat is the main priority having missiles working the pip convergence a lot of it a lot of the issues could be due to server issues or ships having vulnerable areas that they're not aware of there's lots of things that they want to do that is making this high high priority so they're working away at getting ship combat and flight combat feeling good after that he says it's things like boxes going missing and clipping through floors Anything that stops general gameplay as well. Uh, anyway, I did just mention about priorities. Just because something is not on the roadmap doesn't mean it's not a priority to them. Obviously, things like server-side object container streaming is well underway and many of the devs have been pulled off other areas to work on it. Sometimes they want to surprise people as well uh, or they don't want to put a load of pressure on the devs due to something being on the roadmap coming up soon. So just because you don't see it or hear about it doesn't mean they don't know about it. Anyway, that was Reverse the Verse, guys. Some really good stuff there. As always with Todd Pappy, a genuine, genuine asset to Star Citizen. Let me know your thoughts. Let's move on. So we knew that CIG were planning to remove the $0 CCUs. That is no surprise. However, it looks as though they have managed to delete the CCUs based on the current ship value rather than the melt value of the CCU itself. So basically, if you paid for an upgrade a while back and now the two ships you applied it to at the same price, you lose the ship and become out of pocket. Be sure to check your hangar log to see if you are affected. I believe this is likely a mistake by CIG or Turbulent, and they will rectify it, so don't panic just yet. I would suggest contacting the relevant channels and just letting them know. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we hear on Spectrum from someone explaining what happened and that they are working on fixing it. Maybe not today, but possibly on Monday. So also this week, there was a new This Day in History post titled Governance Modernization Act. I am still yet to read that. There is an invitation to join CIG Live for one of its upcoming Star Citizen Live shows. I believe this is in LA, so do check this out on their website. And finally, Squadron 42's monthly report is available. However, this, I believe, is a repost of last month's, which I have already covered in the video. And if you follow the link in the description, you can watch that now. So that brings us to the end of the show. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a video. Hit that thumbs up if you enjoyed it and share the video with all your friends. If you like what I do and want to help me make it better, follow the link below to my Patreon page to learn more.